It's only wacky if we think of ourselves as a shining city on a hill. Well, look, I will seize any opportunity to associate myself with Dahlia and Andrew, even if it is in error. Um, <laughs> but I think probably we all could have agreed that for Thomas and Alito, I'm not surprised. I mean, those two long ago traded in their black robes for red hats. But for some of the other ones, it really was surprising. And in one particular way that I think Congresswoman Lofgren hinted at, which is that Supreme Court justices, and in particular conservative Supreme Court justices, like to say that their job is limited to solely decide the case before them. They are not legislators. They are not making big pronouncements. They are deciding the narrow case before them. And what was surprising and amazing today is they did everything but address the case before them, which, as you pointed out at the beginning, Nicole, was this is a case about whether a president should be immune from prosecution and accountability for trying to overturn the results of an election. That's the case. And what I hope will happen before the ultimate opinion is written, and hopefully quickly, is that there will be a sane five votes to say, whatever the outer bounds of immunity are, they don't cover that. And there's still a chance for the, for the court to do that. And I, I guess I'll be the fool again if, in, if indeed they don't go there, but I hope they still do. You know, Maya, the Supreme Court has plunged in terms of the public's respect for it and regard faster and farther than any institution, faster than the media, faster than Congress. Um, faster than any state house, any sort of state elector, uh, elected officials. And one of the things that makes them different when it comes to January 6th is that Trump's January 6th cases, he lost 60 out of 61 of them. Those were judges appointed in some instances by Trump, by Bush, by, by Clinton, and by Obama. 60 to 1 in terms of his record there. You also had federal judge, I think, David Carter in California early on saying, more likely than not, Trump committed felonies. Felonies. So all that was left to figure out in the intervening, what, four years now, was whether or not he'd be accountable for it. I mean, there, there's a schism also between the justices, just their questions before they make any decision, and the judges who were already on the record about the conduct on January 6th. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, look, let's back up and talk about one of the reasons why people don't have a lot of faith in this court is because this is the first Supreme Court since we have had the second Reconstruction in this country, meaning the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s that started actually making sure the Constitution applied. It is the first court that has actually taken away from the American people fundamental rights, right. the fundamental right to abortion, for example. I mean, there are all kinds of voting rights it has greatly eroded, mm -hmm. but it's also how it was constituted, right? You had an Alina Haba that said, this is going to go well for Trump because he appointed the justices. That's something you wouldn't normally hear a lawyer say out loud for very good reason, because it's not supposed to be true, nor is it considered very politic to say it. But in this case, I think the American public's also looking at these justices. You make the point about Clarence Thomas and the fact that he should be recused. He shouldn't even be sitting up there uh, because of Jenny Thomas's activities. But we also have, and his own, but we also have the fact that Neil Gorsuch would not be on that court if it weren't that Mitch McConnell made up a rule that didn't exist that said Barack Obama didn't get a hearing on his nominee for a, for a vacancy a year before an election. Amy Coney Barrett, therefore, should not be on that court because if that rule that didn't exist had existed, <laughs> she would have been just a few months outside of his that real life. So all, all I'm saying is everybody's looking at this saying, the court itself is rigged. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you think about the democratic processes by which we have usually had bipartisan agreement about how the Supreme Court's even constituted and what it actually does. Mm -hmm. So when you get to this point, mm -hmm. when you get to this point... What do you expect? What do you yeah. expect? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a smart point. Um, Congresswoman, what... What are people who were hoping to see all the evidence that Jack Smith has gathered? I mean, as uh, you, you mentioned, Liz, Liz Cheney talked about all of the people that Jack Smith was able to reach that, that you weren't because they defied congressional subpoenas um, or they weren't forthcoming. I mean, what is the um, prospect for the American people seeing that evidence before the election? Well, it's hard to know. Um, certainly, we'll wait and see what the court does. 
um, you know, it's possible they could lift the stay and make a decision that whatever immunity um, could possibly exist. In this case, clearly there is no immunity and the court could then proceed. That would be at this point the best outcome. We do have some state court actions. The uh, indictment in uh, Arizona is interesting and uh, obviously the former president is an unindicted co-conspirator. We don't know why unindicted, but potentially they are waiting for the immunity ruling as well. And there's a seven-year statute of limitations for those crimes, so uh, he could be added. Uh, we may get quick action there. The state courts seem to move a little bit faster than the federal courts. But the distressing thing, those of us who are all the lawyers are also considered officers of the court. And we're trained to believe in the impartiality of especially the Supreme Court. And I've got to say, uh, our faith has been shaken. They look corrupt. Uh, the process used to appoint them was uh, rigged, and they appear to be partisan hacks. And it's, it's really a very distressing situation for our American democracy. Wow. Um, Dahlia Lithwick, what are the scenarios for what happens next and when we will know what's going to happen next? I think a lot is going to turn on, um, you know, I agree with uh, the folks, I think Ian, who said uh, it doesn't look like the maximalist view of immunity had a lot of takers today. I think there were a lot of takers for some version or other of kicking this back on remand and figuring out some technical legal question, whether it's, you know, what are the boundaries of official acts versus private acts or what the mens rea or mental state requirement uh, of the president would be. In other words, I think there's just a lot of interest uh, from a lot of the justices for taking another look at this before allowing it to go forward. And again, this is an interlocutory appeal on a narrow question, uh, as Ian said, of does the president have this kind of absolute immunity? These are the kinds of things that are supposed to get sorted out after, uh, but it seems that there was an appetite for, you know, sending it back. And what that means, as we've all been saying, is that this is more delay, more delay, uh, which means that a trial that should have already started, that should be well underway, uh, doesn't start. Maybe, you know, the hope was that it would start uh, after the court ruled at the end of June. Now it looks like that is vanishingly uh, 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 possible. And so I think the scenario we're looking at one way or another is uh, unless the court knocks out something quickly in the next couple of days, and that doesn't look like it's on the table, given the breadth of objections we heard today. I think the court hands down something in June that may kick it back for more findings, more determinations, which means that, as everyone is saying, I don't think we get a trial in Judge Chutkin's court uh, before the election. Extraordinary.